Welcome back everyone. Uh, today's video, we're going to do some capacitor replacement work on the Apple II Plus and the two floppy drives. Um, this is more preventative than for repair purposes. This machine is now fully functional. Um, if you recall in the early, one of the earlier videos I shot of this machine, which I got for free off Facebook Marketplace, what a bargain. The display failed within about a few minutes of me turning it on. And um, I discovered that it had at least one faulty cap. So I went ahead and replaced everything that I could with what I had on hand. I do have a, a, a small business, um, a fairly successful business actually doing uh, vintage car stereo repair. Um, so I just happen to have all the equipment and the capacitors on hand to do the job. Um, the equipment that I use for my small business uh, is the Hacko FX Triple Eight D soldering iron. It is a great soldering station at a pretty decent price, hundred bucks, hundred twenty bucks. I think I paid for that. And this guy here, this is the uh, Hacko FR three hundred one desoldering handheld desoldering gun. Um, and those are the two tools that are going to make this job just that much easier. Preventative maintenance um, by doing caps is kind of a controversial subject because it really isn't always necessary to do. Um, but on a on a on a computer that is forty four years old, I'm I'm just going to go ahead and do it. Um, in fact, there are some computers you can't e don't even bother turning them on. You find them in garage sales. I'm going to show you what the, what I'm talking about. These LC these Macintosh LCs. One, two, and three, the Performa series, almost the entire Performa line, actually. Um, the early Power Max. Those early 90s Macs, I'd say from 1998 and earlier to 1990 or so, the SE30, uh, those machines have um, an unfortunate uh, flaw as they get older. The surface mount capacitors, which look like this, I think I have some here, um, they tend to leak. This is what they look like, little metal cans. The rubber seals um, fail, and the electrolyte starts to seep out, and it causes uh, corrosion and short circuits all over the motherboard. In addition to the other little minor problem of the onboard batteries beginning to to, uh, to disintegrate and cause even further damage. If you find an early Mac from 19, like, the, the, we'll just call them the beige Macs, um, anything newer than a Macintosh Plus and anything older than a G3, up until including the G3s now, because those are starting to get pretty old, don't even bother turning them on without doing a cap job. You have to do it. it. It's just, if you want to participate in the vintage Macintosh hobby, that is, unfortunately, the barrier to entry. <laughs> when you find these things for sale in yard sales, flea markets, on eBay, Facebook Marketplace, either work, working or not, whether it works or not, you have to do a cap job. If you don't have the equipment and the skills to do surface mount soldering, and to do that, you're going to need one of these, a, um, this is a hot air station. I use mine all the time. If you don't have the equipment or the skills to do it, uh, fortunately, there is a company in Rochester, New York, that's Amiga of Rochester, and they will recap your vintage Macs, your PCs. Another one, um, this compact over here, this, this compact um, Contora. Is another example of a machine that needed it badly. This is um, this is one of my favorite laptops, and um, it needed caps both in the display and the power supply circuit, and they were bad. Um, so again, vintage computer collecting, um, just due to the the age of these machines, has now you know reached a point where capacitors are going to be needed there you are going to need to either learn how to change them out or you're going to have to start finding someone who can do it for you but like i said amiga of rochester is one company that will do the job for you and i don't know what their rate is but it doesn't matter because they do good work i've met the owner he's a great guy um 
and uh, you know you can find him pretty easily online but if you do have the skills and the equipment uh, there's another company that makes the job just a little bit easier and again these are not sponsors I am not sponsored by anybody I'm self-funded um, this entire channel, I've never done sponsorships, but I, I don't mind, and I actually would love to, uh, promote companies who are, um, and, and individuals who are helping to keep this hobby alive, and one of those is Console 5. Console 5 is a company that builds capacitor lists, uh, bill of materials, if you will, for the most commonly collected vintage equipment. Um, and they package, they purchase and package the capacitors that you need to rebuild that piece of equipment um, for you. They do all the footwork. All you have to do is look on their website and find the kit that you need, if they have it, and just place an order. So what I have here are three cap kits. One of these is for the, the Apple II power supply, the Apple II Plus with the Aztec power supply, 120 volt. There is there's about three or four different kits for the early Apple IIs, and um, you want to make sure you get the right one. And then I've got one each for the disk two floppy drives. So these are the items that you're going to want to change out, including the Rifa cap, which is a ticking time bomb. Um, well-known ticking time bomb in these early machines. So this whole package here wasn't very expensive. It was around $30, $35 or so shipped to my house. And um, I could have built my own cap list by taking the power supply out, marking off what's in there, and then going over to Mauser and then just ordering what I need. But this just eliminates that entire step altogether. I could just... Place an order, buy the kits, and throw them in. Because I already have a small business doing through-hole and surface mount soldering. I have all the equipment right there. So, let's get busy. We're going to pull the power supply out of the 2+. Plus. We're going to do that first, and then we'll do one of the floppy drives. And then I'll do the other one later on. Um, but once again, I, I, I really love to see entrepreneurship um, in this, in, in really any hobby, but especially vintage computing, because these machines are getting so old that um, parts that you wouldn't even think of replacing are now starting to age out. And it's fortunately with capacitors, it's an easy job and the parts are generally readily available. Um, when we start getting into microchips, RAM chips, etc., it's going to take a whole new set of entrepreneurs to uh, reproduce those. Um, eventually those chips will fail just from, you know, just from the materials that they're made of just aging out. But we're gonna keep these systems going for as long as we can. And, you know, just another shout out um, to Jesse Fenn who did my, um, my laptop battery rebuild on the Compact Contora. Um, again, you know, that's another example. Laptop batteries uh, for vintage laptops you can't just buy those anymore. But you can generally get the cells that are internal to the battery pack, and you can rebuild the battery, make it new again. Um, literally a brand new battery for a 30-year-old laptop. So shout out again to Jesse Finn um, of 80s Compact PC, I think is his YouTube channel. I, I got him mixed up with somebody else a while back, but... 80s Compact PC is his YouTube channel. Reach out to him if you need a battery built. Let's get cracking. Before we dive in, I want to show you guys something. A very common issue with the early Apple IIs, the 2, 2 Plus, 2E. These, um, probably even the Helen Bowels. No, those are screwed together. Well, anyway, on these ones, these little, um, these are actually Scotch Lock strips. And that's what holds the cover on. And they're mounted with adhesive to the shell, um, the, the outer cover, and the, uh, the chassis. Now, they're always breaking off the entire thing because it's such a strong grip that they tend to pull off the, uh, the original adhesive strips. 
My solution, which I've used for a while, and, and well, pretty much every one that I've owned in the past, um, I actually take the, um, uh, I just scuff up the surfaces of each each surface that, that, that separated. And I'll use Loctite Ultra Gel Super Glue, which I don't have on my bench at the moment. I'll have to get another tube of it. But I'll use that. I'll spread it on both layers in a thin layer to spread it on, on, on I'm sorry, on both surfaces. Put it back where it belongs. And I'm going to grab a small clamp and I'll clamp it overnight. I use um, just these little Irwin uh, woodworking clamps. Just clamp it. And that will actually rebond the uh, material back together again. So that, that works for me. Um, and it should work for you guys as well. Just take the, uh, I think I'm going to have to unbolt it from the bottom. So we'll just unplug everything here. We'll do the power supply first. Now it screws in from the bottom. We'll take the, uh, the language card out. Just put it over to the side here. Unplug the uh, PSU. And again, this one is not dead. This one works pretty well. Um, but we want to keep it that way. And we know that this is one of them ticking time bombs. So we'll just uh, go ahead and, and make the necessary repairs preventatively. Okay, so it's time that we uh, pull this guy apart. Now, I'll be honest, I expected this power supply to weigh a lot more than it does. I thought for sure I don't know why I thought this, but this was a, a linear power supply, and it feels like a switching power supply. Oh, look at this. Looks like we've got a few little challenges ahead of us, because uh, there's rivets holding it shut. That's okay. We can drill those out. A lot of screws. But we're doing something to prevent a future failure. And if we do the job right... Well, we'll succeed. But we looks like we're going to be drilling a rivet today. Two rivets. So power supplies are one of those parts that the computer manufacturers do not want the end user or even field service technicians um, messing about inside. But I did call the Apple store, and they are fresh out of Apple II power supplies. So there goes that. Uh, looks like we're going to have to drill, baby. All right, let me go grab a drill. Instead of 964. And again, if this is a job you don't want to do on your own, no worries. There's Amiga of Rochester. They can do these jobs. Maybe just wants to spin. you'll know that obviously we have to be careful because we've just released metal inside there and we catch it at an angle like this even though the rivet is spinning we'll wear it out As soon as you get the rivet head off, stop. Do not continue. All right, so this thing should just come right apart, right? Bottom cover. be honest I've never had this model power supply apart so there we go metal out of there I see some caps here that are not in my kit but I do see that Riffa cap um 
All right. Yeah. So the kit doesn't include every cap. It includes most of them, but not all of them. So I assume that they've determined which ones need to be changed and which ones are okay to leave alone. All right. We'll give it a shot. Let's get it apart. So, if you look, like for example, these 10 volt 1000s. Are there any of those in here? Oh, it does have the 10 1000s. I need one, two, three, four, five. I see one, two, three, four. Um, I see four. Did I get jilted or what? Why are there only four in the kit? The 47 microfarad 250s, one, two, three, four. That's going to be these guys. Yep, yeah, I got those. I think I'm missing a, I'm missing a cap. I'll have to reach out and see if there's a reason why that is. Uh, oh, no, wait. No, no, no. I'm wrong. Okay, there is a 16680. And uh, there it is. Okay, so we're good. We're good. I think we're good. Okay. And we've got the 0.1 microfarad. I've got two Riffic caps there. And we've only got this one here. I don't know why that is. 310 volt X2.01. That's the smaller of the two. The big one. Or is that a fuse? No, that's a, that's a cap. All right. Let's just, let's just dive in, shall we? So when I, so when I do a, 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 my own bill of materials, if I'm recapping something, I actually get a list of every single cap and I replace them all. So maybe there's a reason why. I, I don't know. Okay. I'm not going to I'm not going to draw any conclusions here. Let's just let's just do the job. All right. Let's get those screws out of there. Undo this ground wire. It's right there. All right. Okay, there's that ground wire, screw and washer. Put those aside. There's additional screws here. You know, for a power supply that's uh, four years older than me, it looks nice inside. It looks really nice. So this guy here, you uh, want to rotate this. Or if you can rotate it. Let's see if I'm zooming this out here. Our video look. Is it zoomed out? Yeah, it's zoomed out all the way. Move it back a little bit more. All right. See? Okay. All right. The um, are those soldered in place? Oh, those are all soldered. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to get a pair of pliers. First of all, why don't we go ahead and warm up our equipment. I'll turn the desoldering iron uh, station and the soldering station. Uh, turn those on. Now with these, I, they're typically, uh, they're rammed in and they're not easy to remove. So... And that is by design. Let's see how we can get this out of there without breaking anything. <coughs> there we go, we got that out of there. Okay. Good, good, good. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to hinge it up over, over like this. 
why replace only one of the two reefer caps? Why not replace them both? Mm. Look at this, uh, look at this board. This is all hand drawn. Probably on drafting paper. That's how they used to do it before they went all computerized. Yep, that's how it was done back in the day. All right. Yeah, there's a little bit of metal in there. We're going to have to wipe this out with a microfiber cloth. All right, so let's start with these uh, 25047s. Sometimes using the tool to uh, to manipulate the uh, the leads can be catastrophically bad. Leads to burns. All right, this guy's ready to come out. So pull that out. So the board is marked positive, but make sure you you make note of that. Ooh. Guy was starting to leak. It looks like so. The two and these are uh, Nippon Chemicons. All right. Just make note of the orientation of these caps as you pull them. Just just in case the board isn't marked easily. Uh, sometimes they're not. Sometimes it can be a bit of a challenge. Now you can do this without a proper desoldering unit like I have here. Um, this is a 300 some odd dollar tool. Um, I only have this because I use it nearly every day. And uh, it's made my life a lot easier. Um, but you can do this with solder wick. It just takes longer. Yeah, this one's better marked. I'm, I'm sure these are good. I'm sure these old ones are fine. Um, but again, we're doing this as a prophylactic measure and that's all. So when I get ahead of it, the physical size of the capacitor doesn't matter as long as it fits. Um, so even though the new ones are smaller, it doesn't make them any better or any worse. So don't worry about that. Okay. So this one, the negative is pointing towards the heat sink and that's what I'm going to replicate. 5047 negative towards the heat sink. At the end of this, we're going to go ahead. There's only a few caps here. There's not really a ton. And we're going to go and we're going to actually going to test them. I have a, a, a cap tester. We'll, we'll just see how they rate. What I've learned is that they can actually, as they age, the, um, they can do some funny things. They can actually show like a very strong capacitance, all right? As they get older, sometimes that actually happens. And it looks like they're improving with age, but they're really not. It's, it's, not, it's not what you want. You, you, you don't want that. You want them to remain at their original value as long as possible. That's the idea. Okay, so we've done all those. Now we're going to go ahead and I'm going to re-solder them back. And uh, I'm going to do the remaining caps off camera so I can just kind of focus and concentrate on what I'm doing. But when you're looking, when you're working on older circuit boards like this, where the, 
the, the traces aren't uh, always um, masked. The solder is going to flow every which way. Just keep in mind. Newer boards that are properly masked with modern technology, um, they're a little bit easier to, uh, to solder to. But these old ones are, just keep in mind, you're, you're gonna get solder everywhere. It's just gonna start flowing all the way down the track. And uh, you just wanna make sure that you focus your attention on the joint itself. On the plus side, these are a lot easier to fix. If you tear a trace off, or you ruin one, um, it's nothing to fix. It's really easy to do. They they partially mask these, so the, this one this is not a bad this is not a, an example of one that would just run wild. I've worked on boards that were completely unmasked, and uh, yeah, they're, they're entertaining. One way to put it. We're using leaded solder, by the way. I use leaded solder because it, it just works better and I'm not alone. I've tried doing lead free solder in some projects and it just doesn't flow nice. It's, um, I mean, it works, it's safer. It's, you know, it's, it's definitely an improvement, but I don't like working with lead free solder. So fortunately everything on here is leaded anyway. So. It's not like we're taking it out of Rojas compliance because Rojas did not exist in 1980. But those are our four first, first four caps. When I'm done, we're gonna test them all and see how they show up on the meter. All right, so we got all the caps done. And um, it looks like my kit is missing a reefer cap. So I'm gonna reach out to console five on that one. And you look at the casings on these and they're all cracking apart. I don't think they're supposed to do that. These could be like on their way to letting loose. Um, that's my theory here. And uh, I'm going to find out if there's a if there's an oversight or if, if it really doesn't need to be replaced. I don't know. I don't know. But um, all the other caps are done. And uh, if there is a missing part for my kit, which it could happen, and I'm not going to be mad about it, I'll just reach out to them and say, hey, could you... Could you spare a brother a, a riff -a cap replacement? Um, so let's go ahead and test all the caps we changed out. And by the way, I am not going to power the system up until we get that resolved. So um, I'll probably upload this video, you know, ahead of time, and maybe we can talk about it later. But um, let's go ahead and grab the Peak uh, ESR-70. And we will get a reading on these and see what we got. This is a 16 volt 330. See, it's 445. So it's supposed to be within 20% of 330. So it's actually gone up in value. I didn't realize that that was a thing that could happen until I started seeing a pattern of this. That is way out of spec. This one's uh, 220. It's 275. Eh. ESR looks good on these, though. I mean, at least there's that. It's a 1000. And we got 1700. It's almost double. So capacitance apparently can go up as they age out. And I find that strange, but it is a thing that can happen. 448 it should be a 330 oh my god this one is a 1000 1600 my friends another 1000 1676 at least they're consistent ESR is quite low point set point oh seven almost nothing for resistance. You know, that might be what it is. The ESR can actually go down as part of a failure mode. It doesn't always have to go up, um, which could mean the caps are almost shorted. 968, oh, this one's good, but 0 0.07 on the ESR. Ah. 
261, and it is a 220, so that one would be uh, somewhat passable. Here's a 220. So, no cool question. These were out of spec. 223. Hmm? And this one here is a 47 microfarad. And what we got here? 52. It's a 250 volt. Another 47. 55. And this one here. This one, I it looked like it might be leaking a little bit. It's another 47. 55. Okay. And we're going to look at that Riffa cap, too, just because. But, yeah, I won't be continuing on until I know for sure. Yeah, 53, and it should be a 47. So, that 53, that's fine. Like, that would be passable. But if it measured 100, well, that would be probably not good. Now, this next one is a Rificap. I, I don't know whether my ESR meter will register it or not, but we're going to see what it does. Let's see what it does. Oh, you know what? This is a 0.01 microfarad, so it's going to come up open or dead. It can't measure that low. Yeah, open circuit. So it can't measure one that low. Um, I'm going to just put that aside for a second. So let me do my homework on this one, and then we'll see what happens. All right. So this is the fun part where we get to uh, tear this keyboard down. Taking a few photos of it just so I have them on hand, um, just to show how these keys go back on. The reset key had a spring attached to it. I, uh, maybe that's, oh, I know why. Probably to make it harder to press, yeah. But these keys just pop right off. And as long as the switch plungers don't break. Um, I did a full keyboard test on this um, right around the time I got it, and everything looked on the up and up. So every key works. And we just want to get all the grime out of it. And uh, we'll take the keys, we'll put them in hot water. Um, I have an ultrasonic cleaner, but I find that it damages plastics, uh, so we'll just do it the hard way. Even the return key doesn't have a balancing bar. I, I find that strange. Let me just take all of these. This is a very non-standard keyboard. Um, it has keys that are obsolete. Um, well, that have been rendered obsolete. Like, why is there a key that says bell on it? Um, I don't even know what that does. And, uh, got no caps lock, because caps lock wasn't invented yet. Um, which is mind-blowing. I mean, it just shows just how early this machine is. There's the power... Oh, yeah, there's, there you go. There's your power indicator, and that's where the power lamp goes. Um, that is replaceable. Um, with a soldering iron. Anything's replaceable with a soldering iron. And I'll take all these off. I love the army green color of these keys. It's, it just really puts it, 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 it locks this computer in a very specific era, you know, late seventies, early eighties. All right, all these keys are disgusting. And I'm going to just take the key, the space bar bar. No, I'm going to leave it alone. We'll leave that bar there. I don't want to ruin anything. And we'll just take our paintbrush and we'll just go like this. No harsh chemicals needed. No air pressure needed. We don't want to force dust where it don't belong. Just going to give it a nice brush. I don't want to have to split this keyboard apart if I don't have to. Believe me, I don't want to do that. But if I have to, I will, you know. One of those, you know, just do it a good, good dusting. So this is, a, as I enter, so it says copyright 79. So this is probably, once you got all the major dust off, we can kind of probably be a little more aggressive. Um, 1979, that would put this at 
but uh, yeah, this is the original plus keyboard, but um, just a revised version of the original 1977 keyboard. I think they have the same layout though. So they're almost indistinguishable, but there are going to be some hardware improvements, changes, maybe some cost cutting. I've never owned an original Apple II. Um, never, never had that opportunity. So the 77 model, I've never, I've never even seen one in person. Oh no, no I have, because I, I believe there was a guy, or a couple of guys at the uh, VCF um, in New Jersey um, that had them set up. And he used a toothbrush to kind of get some of the harder to remove debris and grime. But since we have some time to kill, I'm not in any rush to uh, get this thing up and running, so we can go ahead and do some more. Look at that. That's, now, that's an improvement. Now, fortunately, this was owned by an adult. Um, clearly, weren't eating meatballs at the keyboard all the time, um, as one does. So, it's in really good condition. Oh, look at this. Uh, there's a switch back here. That is S1, it's control or reset. And I believe it changes the function of the reset key. Um, I'll look into that. I'll look into what that does. I guess, God, you gotta appreciate this. I mean, just the, the, the way that they're using chip sockets as plugs. I mean, I've never seen that before. You're gonna find stuff in early machines like this early microcomputers that just make you scratch your head and realize just how much this industry and the equipment has changed. I'm not going to clean the power key, or I'm sorry, the power light indicator. I don't want to ruin the print on this. It looks like it could come off very easily. So we are going, these things, oh yeah, these are double shot, aren't they? So you've got the, so these aren't, these are not silk screened. These are double shot keys. So you've got uh, two different layers of plastic molded together. Um, so let's get these in uh, let's get these in a, um, a colander and I'll, I'll uh, clean them up. So this is all good to go. Um, get the DWP here. Yeah, anyway. So I got the keyboard keys all cleaned. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna let these dry couple hours maybe even overnight but they cleaned up nice just a little bit of windex give them a quick shower and some really hot water and they cleaned up real nice um so i love that it worked out nicely see some of the keys have a little bit of wear on them that's okay it's part of the machine's heritage part of its history and uh you know They all look pretty good. You gotta really watch out for stuff like this. These can get brittle and snap, but that did not happen. It's always a risk, always a chance that could actually ruin your day. Now, once we get an answer on that power supply, I think I'm gonna have to pay for that cap. I don't think it was included in the kit. Um, but I will. Re I did reach out to Console 5 to get an answer on that one, and I don't mind if I have to pay extra because apparently not every power supply has both Rifa caps. Mine does, so I have to. Um, I have to pay the piper for that. So we'll let these uh, let these air dry for a while before we start putting them back in. I'm going to put the keyboard back in the shell and start putting the shell back together because at this point, why not? And um, then we'll wait for that reefa cap to get ordered and put in. We'll be good to go. That's when I'm going to start the floppy drives. Thank you for watching and have a great day. So whoever needs to know this, um, you can remove and install all of these keys and the power indicator without pulling the keyboard. So good to know.
my intention was to pull the keyboard anyway just to clean everything possible but now you know you can you can do it all without ripping the whole thing apart if you if you really don't want to all right let's get one of these drives apart and we'll do the caps on the drive let's see how that goes there were some discrepancies between the kit and what i was pulling out um however that is only uh that is not an issue because um some of the caps were substituted for higher voltages but i preferred to keep them the same as to what was originally spec'd for the uh, power supply since it worked so well for 40 years 44 years i figured i'd put back what was originally there so i did not end up using some of the caps that were in the kit only because i have my own inventory of capacitors and i just had them right at my at, <clears throat> at the ready so to clarify, yes, you can use higher voltage caps and even higher capacitance ones, depending on how the circuit was designed. Um, in fact, uh, Console 5 is a very well-respected company in the arcade and vintage computer restoration hobby. And uh, they even explain right here on the back of their card that they do substitute higher voltage caps in almost every scenario. The other problem I had was, now here's my power supply, my uh, the one that I was working on. So one of the issues I had, and I reached out to console five to get a resolution on this, is that um, my power supply has a slight variance in its, in its construction. Um, this capacitor at C23 is supposed to be a ceramic disc. On my power supply, it was a reefa cap. So I'm going to show you what those look like. Here they are. So here's the, uh, the, the cap that you typically find on this particular power supply, which is an Aztec. Uh, AA11040B. This is what you'll typically find at C1. This is a RIFA cap. It is a metallized polymer cap. You can actually see part of that right there and through the, through the epoxy. These capacitors are known for exploding. What happens is the, uh, the epoxy shell begins to crack. And by the way, I'm, 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 I'm I have a, um, a fireball in my mouth, which comes with every console five kit. So if you didn't need another reason to buy from them, you get a free fireball with every cap kit. But unlike the tasty fireballs, these are real fireballs. Uh, they typically let loose because air gets into them from these cracks. So these caps were pretty much end 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 of life. Um, on borrowed time is is uh, probably a more appropriate way to put it. The fact that these did not blow up in my face is actually a miracle. Anyway, the cap kit and the schematic for this power supply specify a ceramic disc capacitor, which does not typically fail um, catastrophically or otherwise. <coughs> so the 0.01 microfarad 300 volt um, RIFA cap, or the metallized polymer cap, polypropylene, sorry, um, these are not included unless you ask for them and he'll charge you like, it's like a couple cents more for this cap. I recommend if you're going to be recapping, um, any power supply that you, or really anything, that you take it apart first and then order the cap kit and make sure that what you have matches what is in the cap kit. Case in point, I recapped both of my floppy drives. My disc one, disc two, um, both of which are the disc two um, floppy drives. And I found that even though they're identical in every way, they both use the same basic Shugart mechanism. Um, however, one of them does not say Shugart anywhere on it. And it uses a completely different list of caps than what was in the kit. So once again... Before you order a kit from Console 5, that you check their um, 
in their wiki page, it actually shows what caps are included in each kit. And then you make sure that it matches up. And once again, allowing for over voltage um, on the replacement caps because they do have, he is shipping larger uh, caps. Now this kit right here is actually for the LC3. Um, one of my power supplies, this one right here, blew up and I thought I would give it a try, uh, give it a try. We'll, we'll recap that. But first, um, all the work is done on the Apple II. I just need to put in this one Rifa cap or replacement Rifa cap and, um, and, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll smoke test it and see what happens. Okay. I had to go find the cover. So, um, before I go and rivet this thing shut, um, because it's held together with rivets. I want to, we want to smoke test everything. I don't want to have to put this thing into the machine and just start having all kinds of problems. So why don't we rig up, I can shut the soldering iron off. I'm going to rig up my um, multimeter. Now this, unlike a, a, an ATX power supply, it should just turn right on without any, uh, without any, drama so you've got your uh blacks or your grounds and then you've got red the green orange blue and yellow and we'll see what kind of voltage we get out of those and uh so i ended up i i recapped the power supply and both floppy drives as well as the interface cards so every electrolytic in the machine and the monitor at this point has been replaced Make sure this thing is off. Turn it on. There's no fans or anything. Nothing weird. If we hear smoke, well, we have a problem. Here we go. What I meant to say was if we see smoke. But I'm going to check all the voltages. I don't know what they're supposed to be. I didn't look at the uh, specs on this thing. But I just want to make sure that we're getting something reasonable out of this before I put it into the computer. So I'm going to check my ground against these other pins. There we go. We got 11.5, 4.8, that's our 5 volt, our 12 volt, 5.33, 12.72. And then you got the two grounds. So the grounds should... Okay. Oh, that's interesting. Um, it's coming up as negative. So it's reverse polarity there and, and there too. What do we have? A negative ground, a positive ground here? What's the, what the hell? Um, ah, I guess so. Oh, that's bizarre. Um, I'm sure there's a reason for that and some complicated uh, electrical engineer explanation for why I'm getting negative out of positive and positive out of negative, but that shouldn't have anything to do with anything I did. So, all right. I think it's safe to, uh, to screw it together and um, put it in. So we'll go ahead and rivet it shut and uh, get every one of these hundred screws put back where they belong. But yeah, mine definitely has a, a strange production. It's almost like they ran out of, and, and you know, you'll find that sometimes, even on newer stuff, where they run out of a part and they'll substitute it for something else. So they probably just ran out of disc caps that day and they had a whole bunch of 0.01 microfarad uh, Rifa caps and they stuffed that in there. Because why not run what you brung, as they say? And uh, why am I getting negative? Well, that's fucking weird. We are going to uh, rivet this thing shut. So I'm going to go grab my rivet gun. And we're going to uh, go ahead and do the thing. Um, because that's how Jobs intended it, or was. Was personally. But every rivet, I, true story, Steve Wozniak put every rivet personally in the in these power supplies just kidding
I mean, if you can't get my humor and my sarcasm, please, um, please reevaluate my videos that you've already seen because I try to be humorous even though I'm not funny at all. So there you go. One recap power supply. We'll put it, put it back in. Let me go rivet this thing shut. Now I know most folks would not bother with the rivets, but I am just that much of a purist. And, uh, you know, I just, I can't help myself. Now it goes without saying that I have already made sure there are no um, filings in the box from when I drilled out the original rivets, but there we go. All nice and tight and right. What do we want? I think that's Apple. I don't think that's gonna work. We'll try it. Try something else. That drive sounds unhealthy. Huh. I mean, it's seeking. There it goes. brightness way down perfect okay number munchers multiples factors primes oh I suck at math I don't need instructions though get rated right a munch numbers so everything seems to be just fine um, not that I expected any different. Now, I don't have an up arrow. How am I supposed to go up? How am I supposed to go up? Oh, there we go. A and Z. What's oh, multiples of two. Okay, that's, let's try that again. That's embarrassing. And I graduated. Only took me five years. Just kidding. I did it in I did it in the normal four. I don't wanna uh, Okay. Uh multiples of two. I believe that would be sixteen. Or eight. Yeah. Six. You know, it's not a bad idea. When you're forty years old, you really need to brush up in your math. And number munchers is a good way to do that. You know what I mean? Number munchers is a great tool to sharpen your brain uh, muscles. See, you know, it's always a good idea. Never, never underestimate the value of children's computer games because you just, you know, we all lose, we all lose our intelligence as we age. And uh, these games are great for just a little bit of, Multiples of three. Oh, this one's going to be hard. Um, let's see. Divided by three. Dividable. Oh, I know nine for sure. Seriously, this is uh, this is harder than it than it looks. 
Um, let's see. I know 26. God, this is like second grade. Oh, 21. I think 21 was the one I was looking for. Hold on. There we go. 12, 21. Uh, whoops. I, that was, I, I didn't mean to do that. I swear to God. 